Hello, my name is Miss Lynn, and I'm standing here in front of the Tallman House. We sure hope that you come and join us and come tour our lovely home. And this is my friend, Miss Mary. I'm getting ready for a ball tonight. However, I have to stay here and uh, wait all the people who are coming to call. We would also like you to come join us and see the women's fashion show. And later, Mrs. Lincoln will also be speaking about the women's roles in the Civil War. talking about for the next half hour are the ways various ladies would have been dressing during the Civil War. So we have Mrs. Grant and Mrs. Lincoln who will also be talking with us and, and discussing things. Um, do you want to start with the underpinnings or the dresses? I think that would be altogether fitting and proper. Especially if the gentlemen will please avert their eyes. <laughs> <laughs> um, right.
They're not the instruments of torture that they're often cons considered to be or perceived to be. Once they can be if they're not made properly. Yes. But um, once the laces are adjusted properly and there are strings that you can tie, uh, a woman could actually get into her corset totally independently. <laughs> you know, I, I know there, there, I'm told there are movies that actually show women dressing, you know, being laced into their corsets. This mm -hmm. probably wasn't the case in most instances. Um, over that, we place a cage crinoline. Ooh, and I left my over the slip right there on that glass oh, oh, table. Ah, yes, yes. Would you, would you come? Yes, yeah, she's going to show the wrapper. Ah. So that would be placed over the cage because we don't want to show the bones. This doesn't. This particular over petticoat does not fit the uh, the cage. Cage. They would have. They would have been made to fit whatever crinoline you would have had on, and you might have had varying circumferences if you were a lady of fashion for various dresses and various purposes. But basically, the over the hoop petticoat would have been to keep your dress from the cage and keep it from showing. Creating what they call a lampshade effect where you can see each one of these bones showing through the fabric. So it smooths the line. Uh, so and that's what the lady would have put on before. Before she put on her outer garments. <laughs> she, <laughs> might, she might also have worn a modesty petticoat underneath. And depending on the weight of her dress, she might have had more than one over the crinoline petticoats. But it really was a freeing sure. device because remember prior to that, seven to ten highly starched petticoats that would come in on you. Yeah. Uh, I can't believe all women wore this. It had to be a woman of a certain amount of money. That's the next wait, 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 wait. That's, that's, <laughs> this, is, this is Norman. I'm, I'm obviously dressed bow. differently than the <laughs> ladies. Yes, you're right. What, we're, what, what, the, what we usually think of as Civil War fashion was very much uh, middle class or upper, upper middle class, class, but obviously you're not going to dress that way on a farm mm -hmm. or, or doing any kind of make. I'm dressed more as a woman would have. You're dressed comfortably. Well, I'm, for, I'm a working woman. I, I, I'm going to be, well, I'm a laundress. I have my laundress set up. I'm a farm woman. But a, a majority of the women, actually, you know, sort of a thing. Certainly, you're right. To, to wear a corset, you're not going to be hauling water and, and, and slapping hogs. You know, that sort of thing. It's not work. So, what we have here is another lady dressed with the underpinnings of a that I'm wearing. Um, notice that um, we still have the chemise, because that really is, again, it, it does take the sweat um, and, and it does perspire. And, and it can get a cooling effect. Um, a chemise, if, when it gets sopping wet with your, with your glowing, um, <laughs> <laughs> the statement was, what is it? Horses, Horses sweat, 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 men perspire, women, women glow. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes we glow like horses. <laughs> <laughs> Evaporation effect. It's kind of like farmers. You know, my dad was a farmer in the 1930s, and he was saying that they would wear their long underwear underneath their shirts and the pants in the summer in the fields because you get that evaporation effect. Natural um, fiber fabrics absorb right. perspiration. They let air get through it to breathe and evaporate. So yeah, it actually helps you know, stay a little bit cooler. So she would still be wearing a chemise. Um, she did, did have pantalettes, the bifurcated pantalettes. Now, I have my chemise tucked into the pantalettes. Um, again, women did a lot there. But I don't have a corset. This is called a stay. And, and there's no metal in this at all. Um, it, it doesn't fit. The, this is my stay, so it doesn't fit this fanatic at all. But it's just laces up front, so it's all just cording. But this is... This, gives you the support because it cinches in here with the cording and gives you the support. So my cording runs down my middle back here and then it cinches in because again, they, they didn't have bras as we know, this was the support you have. And obviously some of us need support. Um, so, so it was just gusseted here and but it was all just heavy duct and then tied on the back and cinched in. And then rather than the cage, which obviously you can't wear that working around the fire, that's not going to work. 
um, you wore a corded petticoat. Um, and a corded petticoat, come in, lady. A corded petticoat is a very old garment, it goes back at least to the Renaissance. Uh, if you've ever tried to wear a long skirt, it snakes between your legs. So the corded petticoat then can be starched, uh, but it just has cords in it then that will keep the, 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 the interior skirt from snaking between your legs and it does give a little flare. So if you see them working on the photographs of the period, their skirts flare a little bit like mine because I'm wearing a corded petticoat under my skirt here. So yeah, this is much more of a working woman's sort of undergarments. And then I put my dress on over the top. Any questions about underpinning? What are the hoops made of? This would, would have been metal rods, the little steel wire, wire, steel wire, wire. with uh, like a duct material combining it to put it down the top. Now there are others that are uh, cloth with the steel rods in it, more like slips with, with steel rods. Well, actually, I have. Yeah, you have one on uh, the other. There were two varieties. Ooh. This is a caged. And this is a more of a slip with uh, and glasses. I and I have on the her cage. Oh, a cage. Yeah. yeah. Gentlemen, a virtualized. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 This is made out of a cotton slip. It has casings on the other side, and then that same steel wire is fed through the casing. Uh, so, well, the whalebone was more in the corset. Yeah, the, the, the corset, the the corset the would dresses. also could also have uh, vertical. Steel, 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 yeah, steel, steel yeah, stays. Right, right. Yeah. These were these would have been stays in here, where you don't have that in a stay, in a work stay. Now, I, there's also a pattern out for gestational stays, because obviously, if, as you expand, as you pregnant, that, that's not going to work, of course. It. So the stays then would have be gusseted here with lacing, so you could expand it out as you move along. That still had a support. All right, now we do have another lady joining us, Kathy. This is now, we're going to go back to the lady part of it now. The, the lady. So, as a lady got ready for the day, she would have put her underpinnings on, but if she was going to work around the house or whatever, not, not quite accept visitors yet, she didn't want to put her good dress on, so she had what we called a wrapper. I'm, I'm in my morning wrapper, and this is uh, my house coat of the day, and I'm doing my morning toilet. I'm getting ready, doing my hair, getting it ready for the afternoon. And if I choose to have intimate friends, very, very close friends to receive in the morning, those are the only people that I would allow to see me in this wrapper. Um, I have, um, I'm at the point where I have my overskirt on, my cage. Um, I have my modesty slip a little bit longer because I'm more modest than some people. Um, I have not yet gotten my dress on, but I put my engagements on, my undersleeves that will go with my dress. And the engagements, that's French for undersleeve, because we like to name our clothes these fancy exotic names because then they sound so much more fun. But it just goes underneath. And when I get to the point where my chemisette is on, which is another garment that would go with a sample of that. A we'll chemisette, talk about that in a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Then I would button this to the portion of my chemisette so it wouldn't fall down because it's very unladylike to have my arms show before tea time. So I'm going to be getting dressed for tea later on in the afternoon. And so my dressing maid is not here. I fired her because she just kept doing all kinds of sassy things with her. So, um, my morning wrapper. Though it does look very fancy, um, it can be just as elegant as a day dress or as an afternoon tea dress because, you know, I can afford it. That's the bottom line. And my day cap, I have a morning cap on, which my hair is confined. It's already been dressed for the afternoon in my curls and things, but I'm still keeping it covered because it's proper and ladylike to keep they are confined. Uh, there is a saying, and uh, you can tell which ladies were not ladies by the way they wore their hair. Oh. Uh, you've heard the expression loose woman. <laughs> so the only time our hair is not confined is when, is when you're getting ready to. Okay, so um, a woman who was.
was a loose woman would it look just as elegant as any of us. Maybe even more elegant because she might wear fancy jewelry or something. But you can tell that she was not a woman. Not a proper woman. Not a proper woman. And any um, anybody who knew that I was not a proper woman, should I, if I were, would walk across the street. Would not be seen at the same time. But we're all proper women. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> jewelry might, might have been more fancy. But my hair would have been so I'm not a loose woman. It's combined. It's, you're inside. You're home. Yes. You're not visiting. You're not visiting. You're not visiting. My cap. <laughs> another 23 trips here before we're finished with the orphan train and these babies are very very hungry and we need homes for them after I leave Janesville we're going to be stopping at Rockford but I'm hoping that we can find homes for these babies now but if you can't find it in your heart to, to place one of these babies in your homes I have some feed sack towels that if you would purchase one or two towels, I, the money that I would make from these towels would be enough to feed my babies for at least a day or two. Please help us. These children are, are very, very hungry. We need good homes. Just look at this. How can you resist such a happy face when they know that they could be going to good homes? Please, please, for the children. The orphan train started in 1854. Charles Brace, Reverend Charles Brace, was very concerned about all the homeless children wandering around New York. And he bought a train and started shipping the children out with agents to be placed in the farming communities or in any of the communities where the families would welcome those children. They range in age from a couple weeks up to age 16. All we ask is that you send them to school during the free school year and to Sunday school and church when it's convenient. And for the girls, if you keep them in your household until age 17, it would be very nice. After age 17, if you would give them an allowance so they can support themselves, and for the boys, we're asking that you keep them until age 18. 
and after that pay them a, a maintenance fee so that they can become nice fine young men and start their own households. But right now, these young children need good homes. So please, find it in your hearts to take some of these children. Even being informal, women were still required to keep themselves covered during the day. We were much more modest about showing our skin. We also did not want to be exposed to the sun because we don't think freckles and suntans are particularly attractive. So ladies cover themselves completely during the day from the neck to the floor, from the shoulder to the wrist. When we go outside, we wear gloves, wear uh, head coverings, carry parasol. So a, a proper day dress um, is usually 8 or 10 or 12 yards of material. We're, we're dressed pretty casually, uh, especially for uh, the wife of the general, the wife of the president. But this is pretty much standard, just everyday wear for us. But we have several different styles of dresses. There are a lot of variety in a day dress, a number of different ways that that can be worn. So we, we've, we've put together a fairly good assortment, I think, of different styles of day dress. This particular dress is called a polonaise. It's made all in uh, one piece, basically. Most day dresses are a, a bodice and a skirt, and then you fit the bodice. You can adjust it here, and then you attach the skirt. Uh, this is all cut in one piece. You have to be a very good dressmaker to do this, because you have to get it right the first time. There's no waistband that you can adjust to fit this. So uh, my dressmaker did a very good job on this, all in one piece. Um, the, the, do, the desired silhouette at the time was sort of like an hourglass, wide at the shoulder, narrow in the waist, and then wide again down at the bottom. Um, this particular style of dress is very flattering for just about any body type because it's the trim that tricks the eye. The way that the trim is laid on here is wider at the shoulder, and it, when I have this on, you can see how much it pulls in at the waist, and then comes back out again this way. Um, so even though the, the style of the dress is, uh, the, 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 um, the cut of the dress is straight, it's the, the way that the trim is laid on that tricks you. Uh, this particular dress has buttons down the front, but only about this far. The rest of these are all decorative, and you'll find that on a lot of dresses. Very often the, the dress actually closes with the hook and eye. Even though there's buttons down the front, they're not functional at all. They're strictly for decoration. I had a little girl one time looking at this dress and looking up and she's shaking her head. I said, don't worry, I don't have to button all of these. She said, oh, good. <laughs> about three dozen of them here. Um, the, the style of dress that I have on um, is a skirt and a bodice, two separate pieces. And this is an attached over skirt that is attached to the bodice to create a sort of flounces or layering look here. The style of sleeve on this is called a pagoda sleeve, and I'm also wearing engagements underneath, the uh, undersleeves. The, uh, when you think about it, ladies' dress during this time consisted of between 8 and 12 yards of fabric, on average about 10, depending on how much trim and flounce and everything you wanted to put on it. Uh, and this is before the days of washing machines, dry cleaners, and steam irons, and things like that. So. Um, how many of you would like to hand launder and starch and dry and press 8 or 10 or 12 yards of fabric? We didn't either. So a lot of the dresses are put together in pieces. Collars are separate. Kathy, you have a separate collar, don't you? The collars are separate. The uh, cuffs are separate. Sometimes the hems are separate. So you can take them off, launder them separately, and put them back on without having to wash this entire dress. Also, the dyes are not color fast usually at this time, so you don't want to wash this any more than you absolutely have to. So the separate pieces, the parts that get dirty the fastest, can be taken off, laundered separately, and put back on. This also increases the versatility of your wardrobe because you can put a different kind of sleeve underneath here, a little bit more open if you want more air to get under there and circulate, or a different color if you want to accent, if you have a dress that has a lot of different colors in it, and you want to accent something different, you can put a different color here that will make, bring that out. And this was particularly important to women in the South during the war because the blockade made it very difficult for them to get new things in on a regular basis. And they had to become very ingenious about ways to make something old look new again. So changing the trim on it or changing the uh, accoutrements that went with it um, could be very helpful in making something that was old look brand new.
This is this your aunt. Oh. <clears throat> uh, what I have on is a sheer dress. It, it's a sheer simply because the fabric is very thin, uh, <clears throat> making it cooler in the summer. Uh, it, it too is a two-piece dress. Sometimes the dresses were one piece, sometimes they were two. I happen to have another bodice to this dress, thus I can make my skirt look different. Uh, my, my embellishment is really rather simple for a general's wife, but I prefer simple that I have a ribbon belt that matches the trim on my sleeves. My sleeves look a little different than a pagoda. They're a bishop sleeve, which means that they're, they're widest at the elbow, because remember, I still want to achieve that hourglass wide shoulders. If my sleeves are wider, it makes my waist look smaller, and then the larger skirt over crinoline. I have on a bonnet. Women of a certain age, we won't go, go into that, would have worn bonnets most of the time. You'll see pictures of ladies in various styles of hats. Those were very popular with the younger women, but once you reached a certain degree of maturity, you wore a bonnet. You would also always wear a bonnet to anything religious. In other words, you would wear a bonnet to church. If you were attending a funeral in someone's home, you would wear a bonnet because it was it, it just a matter of respect. If I were going out, I would have on gloves or mitts because, again, I, thank you very much. And I would carry, uh, not mechanical, no, okay. this. this is a parasol. It's not broken. Mm -hmm. No, it's a carriage parasol. It's designed this way. It's called a carriage parasol. It folds up in the middle. There's a hinge here. And then a slide comes down to stiffen it when you want to put it up. And it's not very large. All it needs to be, all it needs to be is enough to get between you and the sun, to keep the sun off your face or the sun out of your eyes. Again, like I said, to keep you from getting suntanned or freckled. Uh, this particular style also tilts. Tits. Oh, so that when you're riding in a, a train a car or a stagecoach, if the sun is coming in through the window, you can turn the top of it to protect you that way. And it folds up. It's called a carriage parasol so that you can put it into your carpet bag and carry it with you. Uh, and, and it fits. Because even though I have a bonnet on, um, earlier bonnets had much wider brims that actually did give your face some protection. But by the time of the Civil War, we ladies had discovered we didn't like to go around um, with blinders on. You know, we felt those were more appropriate for carriage horses. <laughs> and we realized that the bonnet could be uh, a more attractive frame for the face if you could actually see, see one's face. face. So hence, we had to have parasols because the bonnet was um, more decorative than functional. Also, the, uh, the color of the bonnet does not necessarily have to match your dress. What you want to have close to your face is colors that will complement your complexion. And a lot of the trim and flowers and ribbons and anything else that you want to put on the bonnet goes in the face of it. It's and a very the, plain and simple bonnet again. And uh, very often might have small, very small strings that tied under your chin to actually hold it on or put a hat pin through the back. But the wide ribbons here were making this creak a little bit. The wide ribbons here were left to hang open because this is where you usually put very expensive ribbon. And this was another way of saying my husband can, my, yes, my husband has money. Can <laughs> now as we were pointing out, this is the way that ladies dressed during the day. But there is a style of evening dress, uh, dinner dress or a ball gown. When you see Civil War movies, sometimes you see ladies running around outside in the middle of the day with dresses that are off the shoulder. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can see their collarbones. And that's not technically proper. Those style of dresses were worn, but not during the day. As uh, Kathy was pointing out, your skin was not to be exposed until after the sun went down, around tea time. So uh, those kind of dresses were worn, but only in the evening for a, a dinner or a theater engagement or a dance or a ball. And Carol, since this is your dress, I think you should talk about this. I, I do turn into a lady. <laughs> um, what they're trying, this is a ball gown, and um, one of the, 
he did not show cleavage during the Civil War. That was not done. But for some reason, like the ends of his shoulders were considered to be appropriate. So the neckline runs across and then here. So this, again, if you can see the neckline, the body. Um, this particular neckline, though, tends to also gap, especially the gentleman being taller than you. So a lot of them had tuckers or little modesty lace in here for, for the neckline. Um, a lot of ball gown bodices uh, came to a point in the front and the back. And these, by and large, were laced up the back of the dress. So in essence, they're very difficult. You cannot get into them yourself. But if you were getting into a ball gown, of course, you would have a servant or a maid or uh, our, our husbands. You would be very good at putting us into these things. Uh, but it definitely is a dress that, that a, a woman of means would have. Um, again, this one is attached to a skirt um, by buttons. Um, and uh, as, as uh, Mrs. Lincoln said earlier, these skirts are expensive. I, I take about nine yards, and it's better than five yards of fabric in a skirt. So as Mrs. Link, uh, Grant said, she has another bodice for that skirt. Now, I want to show you something about Mrs. Lincoln, or I'm sorry, Mrs. Grant's skirt, dress, I can talk. Uh, it, this is a sheer dress. It's a summer dress. So if you turn around, you can see the lining for her bodice here has the ball gown neckline on it. And this was perfectly acceptable during the day because she's still covered by the gauzy fabric, but this is called a half bodice. Essentially, the lining for the bodice is a ball gown neckline with the sleeves, the short sleeves, so she, you could feel the, the air coming through. But this was still very proper for day, even though it's a half bodice. It's a ball gown lining. Yeah. Now, I noticed on this dress, I don't know, is it the dress a little large? Bigger shoulders, or no. do they always have oh, the no, sleeves? The start no, no, that was the hallmarks of the period okay. is, again, they were trying to emphasize the narrowness of the waist. Okay. So even on my work dress, it's dropped. It's slightly. dropped. This, off. this is a little more extreme. extreme. But this, this was again. Remember hourglass. So if you're wide, wide. up here, narrow. Yeah. Wide. So even the work dresses of the period, it's dropped here. And if you're sewing, you know, usually for us the seam is here. It's right. dropped in back by an inch. Okay. So if you're ever using an actual Civil War pattern, the the seams don't line up square oh, okay. the way we use them. Okay, so, but in order to use this, I have a, another, this would be like a day outfit then, where I could swap this with the same skirt, it's the same material, and make this. Now, Kathy was talking about a chemisette. Oh, here, let me hold. This is called a zoo. oh, I got a button to it. This is a zoo jacket, which was very popular during the period, uh, but it does come out, so this then, again, these are decorative buttons. They don't work. This is actually hook. They did have hook and eye tape, so this is not cheating. But underneath, this is not a blouse. Okay, a chemisette is this. And then these are undersleeves that are attached. As, as, as she's mine are attached to to the bodice itself. So I could remove this. I could wear this without and if it's for tea for like four o'clock. I could wear this. In the afternoon, without the shim set, I could put the shim set on, go through the day. I could swap it out with all with the same skirt. So it was a very again, you were trying to leverage the fabric you had. Yeah. And something else that's very interesting: the zouab jacket was actually uh, a military style jacket that ladies adopted because they uh, redid it a bit to make us to flatter us. But I want to show you the back. The back has a little peplin that fits over here and is really kind of, kind of flirty, Mrs. Norman. <laughs> yes, I know. But it does. So this was, again, uh, yeah, the zoo jackets. I saw, where's the, the lady? Uh, I, I saw her come through. The, uh, Rita, is Rita there? She's got a travel Yeah, that's, that's what I want to show. This idea of a military style of uh, um, <laughs> decorations this is the lady outside. You have not heard her she's play the dulcimer. You want to. But she has, again, a day dress on, but you can see it was very military. It was very patriotic to have military style decorations. 
So she has the epaulettes on her sleeves here. Very, again, an adaptation of a Civil War uniform. Uh, the chevrons, which in military uniforms would have. But again, it's all adapted to a female style. But this was a very patriotic um, sort of decoration. Also draw your attention to the trim that she has on the lower part of her skirt. Again, that is designed to draw your eye and make the bottom of that skirt look wider. Also, it's very convenient for hiding um, grime that accumulated that couldn't be washed off mm -hmm. or any right. tears from traveling. Mm -hmm. Just add another layer of trim. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, too, you might notice on my dress, and this is Grant because it's sheer, we have hem savers on our dresses, too, uh, to try to save the bottom of the fabric uh, because that's where the wear and tear is, obviously. So, so this but, is a, but she had a saver. Mm -hmm. it, it shows a little on the front, but you can see that it's much wider. Gentlemen, please put the dress. Thank you. Um, and thus, you don't get your skirt caught. But she's also with the pagoda sleeves wearing the undersleeves oh, yeah. that are detachable, washable, oh, yeah. you know, and... Um, so cool on underwear today. You know, <laughs> uh, now, they did have elastic in the Civil War, but it was only round, and it wasn't used as much as we used, so it was available, so you could use it on an undersleeve if you didn't want to. Um, it is here. Oh, we're past time. Oh. All right, we're, we're pushing time for the fashion show. Who, who would make the dresses? Dressmaker, or? dressmaker. Very often, ladies made their own clothes, yes. but women of means who were able to hire someone right. uh, would have a dressmaker. I believe you had Mrs. Keckley. I have Mrs. Keckley. Yes. When I lived in Springfield, I did make my clothes, my children's clothes. But once we moved to Washington, uh, a lady was referred to me who had made dresses for other Washington Society ladies. Her name is Elizabeth Keckley, and I was very impressed with her work. And I soon engaged her to sew exclusively for me. <laughs> so, so, but but they did have sewing machines during Civil War too. They were invented, and um, so a, a lot of the straight seams and all could be done if if you had the money to. Have the but you but you had to have means to buy the machines because they did want about sixty five seventy five dollars. Sometimes the ladies of the town would go in together to, to buy, to buy one sewing, sewing machine that they all shared. Share. That it would pass from. Household to or household. Just can, can I interject here? Um, by 1860, one in every five households had a sewing machine. Based oh. on the population, if you look at the census, and the number of sewing machines that had been sold in the United States, one in five households had sewing machines. And often the women formed clubs. They would have subscriptions, and they would buy or purchase a sewing machine together, and then they would designate which months each woman was allowed to keep that sewing machine mm -hmm. in her house. And then at some time, they would get together and do patriotic things, and they had similar life goals mm -hmm. for soldiers. Well, well yeah, that... Um, and, and the sewing machines of those days, um, I suppose some of you may be familiar with the treadle machine. Mm -hmm. That was much more recent. The sewing machine in that day was was a hand crank. Oh. So you cranked and you sewed. Or if you had children, it was a very good employment, <laughs> especially for daughters, to crank turn the crank turn as them. you guided the fabric through. And then fabrics, just a quick one on fabrics. Yours is sheer, but what is the fabric type? And it's then the rest of your clothing. Uh, they had four basic fabrics, okay. five fibers. Wool, cotton, silk, and linen okay. were the four fibers. Now. They did weave the fibers together. There was a thing called flimsy wool, which was wool and linen. 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 Uh, it was a cheaper form of wool. So, yeah. so they had fabrics we no longer have. They, they okay. also would weave silk and wool together and get a, a very beautiful, lightweight... Gabardine. Uh, yes. That was the first gabardine. When the oh. silk and linen were woven together, it was called a union cloth. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, But they had yeah. only four basic fibers. So for the summer, it was cotton, linen, so this basically this this would be a silk, okay. the, the ball gowns. Um, but then of course you had wool. And, and actually, during the Civil War time period, silk was less expensive than cotton. Cotton wow. became because of the blockade, and the cotton was grown in the South. Yep. But it was shipped to England to be milled okay. because the oh. mills that were available in the North were no longer available to the South anymore. Okay. So it was shipped to England and then came back. Uh, and if you're lucky enough to get it back through the blockade. But um, price per pound for cotton toward the end of the Civil War was $25 per pound. Or per bushel, I'm sorry. Okay. Whereas it was less than a dollar per bushel before the Civil War. Wow. Um, and there were silk plantations in the South and in the 
moderate temperatures up until about the 1840s, but soap was less expensive during the Civil War time than coffee. Um, we, we are unfortunately are out of time, but uh, we would love to keep talking with you. Um, the Pete Scully from uh, uh, the Rock County Civil War Roundtable, but he's also on the Wisconsin Heritage Trail Commission, is going to be giving a presentation next. But if you want to keep talking fashion, we'll move it outside. So, uh, <laughs>